Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Ross, can I bump it over to you for, uh, for sure. a similar sort of uh, chat and timeline? Sure. So uh, I'm thinking I've got a, um, to be a fairly contrasting story. So I came from an academic family. And so I came in, I always pretty much had a sense that I wanted to go academia route. And so uh, I did a fair bit of teaching and uh, academic and sort of back end academia type research. One of my year ops was actually more about uh, education than about uh, cutting edge research. And so I, I had a lot of background there. And then I hit grad school. And then that that's where I had a moment of doubt because I ended up in the lab uh, where I didn't have a good advisor fit and a project that was not a good fit for uh, for me. And I was very close to calling it quits with the masters and then looking for a new path. And then a actually a chance conversation with um, an undergrad of the party linked me up with a professor who I'd been interested in working with, but for various reasons hadn't uh, connected with previously, who was looking for uh, uh, graduate students. And so that led me over into his lab. I got to talk with him, figured out an exit strategy from the lab that wasn't working out well. And he uh, helped me bring over, uh, go over to, uh, from being in a pure mechanical engineering lab into a robotics uh, lab. And so I uh, very supportive advisor there. Uh, and so I worked with him uh, for my master's, uh, finished up my master's with him, got my PhD. Uh, in the final year before I defended, uh, I took a summer over in Japan on the uh, National Science Foundation, uh, runs a program called uh, EPSI. It's the East Asia Pacific uh, Summer Internship Program, where they have uh, agreements with about seven countries on the Pacific Rim, where they'll send you over to work in a lab over uh, one of those countries. And so I had, um, while I was at MIT, I had uh, had a Japanese history uh, uh, concentration. And so I'd been wanting to go to Japan for a long time. And so I took advantage of that and I went over and I worked at uh, IST, which is one of the big national labs. And so I got some experience there. It was a great program. They uh, give you um, a living stipend and then some travel money specifically to go and give tours and uh, give talks at lots of different uh, labs around the country. And as part of it, they set you up, you're in a week, uh, spending about a week with uh, about uh, 120 other students coming about half from the US, half from some other Western countries, and they're all put together there. So then by the time you're doing your travel, everyone's off in a different city. So there's always whatever city you're going to for your program, you end up uh, finding someone for the program there and then uh, getting to give the talks there. So I um, spent a summer over there, came back, uh, did a couple of uh, stints in other labs that we were collaborating with. So back at MIT for a couple of weeks, things like that. Uh, and then back to Carnegie Mellon, where I was doing my PhD, finished up there. Um, I had plans to go back to Japan, but uh, this was 2011 as defending. And so March, 2011, Fukushima happened, at which point uh, a lot of my plans got uh, rewritten and I ended up uh, not, uh, not, going, uh, not going there. So um, I then stuck around Carnegie Mellon for another year. I got a um, re uh, postdoc position there where I set up a collaboration between uh, the lab I'd been in and the lab at Georgia Tech. That's now a big ongoing collaboration that I'm still part of. And so I got to set that up. And then um, uh, as I was doing that, I was on the faculty job market and I had two offers. Uh, one of which was from a, it was, was the clear on paper 
uh, thing for me to look at. It was a big lab doing uh, with a couple of people in my area of mathematical robotics research. Uh, it was just would have been a good fit in there. But then I got the uh, this other offer from Oregon State that was um, there's one guy who had been a senior grad student in the lab next to mine uh, when I was uh, when I just moved over into robotics, and he was. Uh, teaming up with a couple of other faculty to start a robotics program out here. And so then there was a pitch come out here, live in Oregon, it's great, and helped found, found the program. And so that attracted me a lot. I liked the idea of being able to uh, do that, um, balance out some of uh, um, work-life responsibilities. There's a good pitch on that balance there. And so in 2012, I moved out here. And so I got tenure a few years ago. We now have a robotics PhD degree, and I am heavily involved with um, uh, guiding where that program is. So I've been by coming in the ground floor, and now I'm being able to uh, work on some uh, on some programming and how to um, design what are what a new robotics degree should be, and then what the culture should be of our lab, and being involved with designing all of that, which wow, has been a very interesting experience. Yeah, for sure, and what an impact, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's great. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's amazing. Oh, Welcome. These are guests. I love it. Susanna, I'm going to have you sort of share a bit as well. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ellen, for hosting as well. Um, so, you know, I think actually, uh, as I was listening to both Ross and, and Nira talk, a lot of their experience sort of resonates with me. I would say, especially in your description of how uh, she, you know, she didn't necessarily always know from birth that she wanted to be in academia, right? And and I was exactly the same way. And you know, I think it's funny because I did know a lot of people at MIT as an undergrad who were very, you know, especially in a major like physics, which is you know very theoretical, right? You know, that people were sort of on that path and knew that they wanted to be on that path. And my feeling was always like well, you haven't done it, nor have you done anything else. So how can you possibly know that's the only thing you want to do, right? Um, so, you know, I, I'm going to try to tell my story honestly, which is that, you know, as an undergrad, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was interested in a lot of things. I actually changed my major three times freshman year, um, which is just a mark of my, my indecision, perhaps. But I ended up in physics really because I, I, you know, just kind of on a whim and because I didn't want to change my major for a fourth time. But but I did like physics and, and I found it interesting, if, if extremely challenging at times. Um, and basically the best thing about my program that I liked was, was the research that I did end up doing. And I worked in a few different labs and the final one I was in was sort of applications oriented towards quantum computing. So as an undergrad, I just thought quantum computing was like the coolest thing. And you know, senior year came around and I don't think I was quite as motivated as Nira. So I didn't apply to a million different things, even though I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I did apply to teach for America. So that's another thing we have in common. And I applied to graduate school. And I only applied to graduate school in California though. So I, I actually grew up on the East Coast. I just wanted to do something new. Um, so I ended up getting in a few places and I decided to go to UC Santa Barbara because it was just, it was so different from the places that I had known. And I was very attracted to the beach and to sort of a fresh start. And you know, my graduate work was mostly in the, in the same kind of area or related area that I had been doing as an undergrad. So I was sort of doing condensed matter and atomic physics, but optical physics, but related to quantum computing. And I had a good time in grad school and, you know, got some results and <laughs> went to the beach, et cetera. Um, but I think by the end of my, you know, five years there, I was really burnt out and I was really burnt out on research. Um, and I, although I liked my advisor as a person, there were aspects of his lifestyle that I did never wanted to emulate in a sense, you know, the staying up all night as, you know, a 45 year old <laughs> writing proposals. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, but again, I reached a point in my life where I didn't really know what I did want to do. So that was still a problem for me. I didn't have good career counselors like Ellen, I think. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I was sort of talked into by a few, uh, let's say of my peers actually, who had you know, done the same thing years earlier, said, look, why, why don't you try to do a postdoc just to get a taste of a different kind of research experience, right? If you go somewhere else, you maybe try out a new field. And one of the things that had been burning me out about my graduate student research was that, although I found quantum computing as an application, like fascinating. And, and again, I still do. Um, let me put it this way. The applications for it were not as fascinating. I was not interested in, you know, uh, the entire, let's, uh, military industrial complex, which is where most of the jobs are in that area right now, right? And that may change in the future, right? That's not 
the only thing that quantum computing is potentially useful for. But anyway, that's the way it seemed when I was graduating in 2010. And so I, uh, so I said, well, I, I had actually worked on quantum dots, this material that came up in my bio, um, you know, to make a qubit with essentially, but uh, quantum dots are useful for many things. And so one of the things I found out they were useful for is making solar cells. And that was an application that really appealed to me, <laughs> to my sense of wanting to do something, let's say useful for the world, right? Um, in a more immediate kind of way. And solving the energy crisis was a problem that, that really excited me and I thought was important and something that I could see myself devoting, you know, my life or career to. And so, you know, I, I, I figured out who were good people in that area and I ended up getting a postdoc position with one of the leaders in that field at the University of Toronto. So I moved to Canada, which was great. You know, I just, I just loved it in Toronto. Um, I had a great, great time. And, you know, just serendipitously, my postdoc mentor uh, was fabulous and he really believed in me and he pushed me. And I don't think I'd be in a faculty position if it wasn't for him. So, you know, just the difference that mentors can make in your life are amazing. And it wasn't something I necessarily sought out, but it sort of came to me and I, and I was lucky. And, and he, he saw something in me, you know, the fact that I liked advising students um, and, you know, that I sort of had this non-traditional background in the sense that I came from physics and I was in electrical engineering now, you know, so um, he pushed me to apply for faculty positions and I, and I sort of capitulated and said, okay, well, I'll, I'll just try it, test it out this year, right? Do a practice run, that kind of thing, see how it goes. And well, I got a, I got a few interviews and I got a few offers and, and I decided to move to Baltimore, which is where my dad grew up to, to accept a job at Johns Hopkins in 2013. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say it's been totally smooth sailing. <laughs> There's some rough, rough patches where I thought seriously about leaving at times. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that um, you know, faculty positions are, are different from, from graduate school, they're different from postdocs. There's a lot of work that is not directly related to the research enterprise or even to the teaching enterprise, which I also enjoy, right? There's a lot of service work and there's a lot of grant writing, which I never, I still have not quite grown to love, let's put it that way, but it's something that we all have to do, right? So, so I do it, um, but I, I did finally get tenure in, in officially in July. And so whew, that was a relief. Um, so thank you. So here I am. And, um, you know, and again, the actually being in a faculty position is is really great fun, especially once you have that security. Um, but even beforehand, there's a lot about it, the flexible schedule, the, the sort of the ability to mentor so many different kinds of students and people I just find really exciting. And, you know, being exposed to just cutting edge work from all of my colleagues in all kinds of different fields, it, it still it still makes me excited and, and keeps me in the game. Yep. Thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for the transparency there. I think it's really appreciated by the audience too. And I'm sort of curious, I just want to, if people would put in the chat, um, I'm trying to get an idea of who we have in the audience tonight. Are we, um, do we have people that are currently in grad school, people that are currently involved in a faculty search? Do we have people that are faculty? Do we have audience members who are um, thinking about it, worried about it? I'm just trying to get an, a sense of, um, okay, so we've got someone, grad student, assistant professor, grad student, postdoc, postdoc, okay, great. It's so, okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that some of the questions that I was thinking of asking um, soon to be assistant professor, great, um, were appropriate. Obviously, feel free to start putting your questions into the chat. This is really about the audience and what you want to ask of our amazing guests that are here tonight. Um, so please, uh, you know, put those in and we will get to those very quickly. Um, I'd much rather ask your questions than um, the questions that I think you're going to ask. But I do want to start us off with sort of the, um, I mean, I worked in the career office for a long time and I've worked with many students on the faculty job search. And I think that we often hear faculty hiring is all about funding. No, no, faculty hiring is all about research and the number of publications. No, no, it's really about the fit with the department. So my question, I guess, um, is at any of this in your experience, what advice do you give to your students? Um, I'm going to go to you, Ross, and ask, um, since I think that you've had such a rich experience and were trying to sort of figure out for yourself with your job offers what was going to be the best, um, I'm just wondering what would you say it was for you, what do you think was so attracting about you to the people that wanted to hire you? So uh, I made a, during my uh, work, I, so I have a, uh, I had all mechanical engineering 
degree background. I've actually sworn off taking math classes several times, but I ended up making a fundamental mathematical discovery as part of uh, as part of my robotics research. And so I had that core piece that had uh, basically what uh, what it um, had done and what it's and what it's led to in my career. People have recognized this would happen is to take an area of mathematical research that had been worked out at uh, Caltech in the late 90s that people had thought they'd reached the end of and thought it had been capped off. And I was able to crack open that cap and open up a, um, a, a whole new um, life for that research and now it's being applied in various places and things like that. And so having that, uh, th th that, key, th that key result and then people recognizing what, what I could do with that key result was one of the uh, things that I think uh, was my core, um, core, core my, one of my core strengths while uh, being on the faculty job market. Interesting. So maybe, I mean, not that it's probably any one thing that you get yeah. hired for, but, yeah, but maybe for you, it was more the, that, that research, what you were going to be able to sort of bring to what, that. What, what I, yeah, what, what I was going to be able to bring to that and then just all the other things I'd done, I'd done to with it. Because I, I had the one breakthrough and I had a number of things where I'd done things that were auxiliary to it and showed how it could yep. play out into a full research program. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's what um, what I think uh, was the core that I was getting recruited for. Yep, that's interesting. Nira, what do you think it was for you or what advice do you give to your students? Sure, I think that, you know, things, uh, some of the, you know, uh, things like publications, I think absolutely matter. So I have one student who, um, uh, I've graduated four PhD students so far. One's gone on to an academic position, albeit at an undergraduate focus institution. So he just started a position at Kettering. So it's a little bit different um, trying to get a, uh, um, a faculty tenure track faculty position at a teaching focus institution as opposed to research. Um, but for an another student that I have uh, uh, is currently at a research lab but then wants to keep that door open. Um, and so I think that in terms of just like getting into the um, into the running, I think that there are at least what I see in, in, in mechanical engineering, you do have to demonstrate that you can publish and that you've got um, uh, that record that you've put up quality papers. I know that um, it's, you know, it's, it's very common for the search committee to, you know, read through your papers, right? So it's not just how many papers they are going to take a look at the quality of the work that you're doing. So I think that that really does speak for itself. Um, but then I, I agree with Ross to the extent that, you know, I think fit um, and being able to bring offer something unique is a big part of it, whether it's, um, a, you know, an amazing discovery like Ross was describing. I think um, in my case, uh, what um, I think made me a really good fit for Purdue um, was that my area is dynamics and controls, but my research, um, uh, at least my graduate research was at the intersection of dynamics and controls and then energy systems. Um, and uh, I had done a lot of work um, in thermodynamics and actually the call that I applied to at Purdue was a thermal systems call. It wasn't a controls call, um, but I sold myself as somebody who could straddle those two fields um, and do some really interesting research that wasn't being done because I was able to actually talk to both communities. Um, and now half of my research program is still doing that. Um, and so uh, I know that, um, I, sh I shouldn't say, I know I'm, I'm fairly certain that that was something that helped me to stand out um, on paper. Sorry, I've lost track of my mouse. Thank you. <laughs> um, Susanna, I'm gonna ask you a little bit of a different question, but it's sort of on that sort of publications because I saw you nodding your head. Um, I mean, are we still in living in a publisher parish world? Um, and um, Nira sort of intimated that it's really about the quality, not so much just the number. Um, but my guess is there probably really is somewhat of a number for you to be competitive. Um, yeah. Do you care to dip into that question <laughs> sure. at all? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, like, are we still living in a publisher parish world? Yes. <laughs> like, if you want to get a faculty job, you have to have published. It is field dependent, right? So, you know, I can tell you what you, I can tell you numbers for my field, but I can't tell you numbers for every field because some fields, people publish a lot of small papers, some fields, people publish a few big papers. Um, but I totally agree with Nira that it, it's also about quality, but, you know, if you wanted, like, and I'm sure some of done this or they should do this, right? You could go through and develop an algorithm that sort of like quantified, you know, how much is a nature or nature family paper worth in terms of other types of journals, right? And because people really like, they do look at stuff like that, right? So the point is, yeah, of course, you want to have high quality publications and, and, you know, having a few high quality publications is probably better than having like a lot of low quality publications, but there's some sort of happy medium there, right? You have to have enough and, you know, maybe I don't want to give exact numbers, but you know, my department 
I would say based on our recent hiring, you know, if you have less than let's say like eight to 10 published papers when you're applying, that's, that's probably too, too few. Mm -hmm. But that's very rough and for my field, right? So. Sure, sure. Well, I think that's helpful though. And I, and I sort of wonder too, I mean, so this isn't, so it's publishing and it's having, being a first author. And do you find that there's challenges with being a first author, depending on the sort of school that you're in and doing your research? Um, or is it about those relationships that you have, or is it, how do you, how do you help, how do you find mentors that will help you be in the right sort of spaces and places to, um, to be able to make those publications possible for yourself? I don't know if I'm asking that in the right way. Um, that one? Sure. Um, so I think that, you know, as an advisor and I don't, and, and, and Ross and Susanna might have different strategies. So, um, I'm, I'm kind of type A, <laughs> and so um, I have a, uh, and I, I got this um, from a mentor. Um, I, when I have, you know, students join my group, certainly um, one of the, you know, I, I basically require three first author journal publications of every student that I graduate. Um, and um, which uh, it, partly because at least in my field and the kind of work that we do, you know, if you can publish three quality journal articles, that really constitutes a quality PhD. Um, um, and, um, and so the first thing that I would say is that certainly, um, you know, if you're, if you're doing quality research, it should not be difficult for you to, to write a paper that you're first author on, because by virtue of doing the research for a PhD, if, if you don't have that, then something's wrong, then you, I don't see how you're defending, right? So, so I think that that's, you know, just there, there's some, you know, base level of, um, publications that ought to be um, that ought to come out of out of your research. Um, the other thing that um, you know, I was really fortunate um, to have an amazing advisor who took mentoring um, and honestly, kind of like career mentoring, really seriously. So I've learned an awful lot from him. He was somebody who was sending me to conferences even when I didn't have a paper um, to make sure that I was starting to get to know people. Um, I did mention this earlier, but he was someone that even after I said no, no, I don't think I want to be a professor, would forward me you know, faculty offers um, for a long time um, and, uh, and and always kind of encouraged me. Um, and so I think that, you know, if if you've got, you know, for all the folks that are on the on the Zoom tonight, you know, if you've if you've got somebody like that, who's who's able to, you know, if it's maybe it's your advisor, or maybe you've um, built a relationship with another faculty member who can introduce you to, you know, the you know, um, other people in your field at conferences, all these little things um, are important. Um, because for example, when I also applied to faculty positions um, for all the schools where I, you know, knew a professor, uh, maybe I'd met them at a workshop when I was a grad student or something like that. I sent them an email directly saying, I just applied to this position. Can I get on the phone with you to find out more about this position, right? So I advocated for myself um, be because I, there were, I had done a good enough job kind of getting to know other people outside of my own advisor and my own PhD committee as a graduate student um, that I could reach out to some of these people. There were a couple instances where I did ask my advisor to make an introduction for me and he happily did that, or he suggested that he do that, right? So. Um, you do, you know, it's it's important to have mentors who are who are going to help you. Um, and if you don't already have that in your own advisor, um, then then seek it out. I'm sure there's another faculty member out there that that you trust that you could reach out to, um, who's in your field and could offer you some some guidance. So that is important. Great. So I'm going to jump around to some questions because I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet. Um, I'm going to jump to Ross. Okay. Ross. So mm -hmm. you made it, right? You got your job offer, you're hired, you're tenured faculty. Um, so going back in the time machine with me and the audience, sure. Sure. what were you most surprised by that first year um, after you were hired? When you, you know, having sort of like, you have a, a sense of what it's gonna be to be, you know, teaching, researching, what, what were you most surprised by? Let's see, so, I came into um, I came into the department on a lot of promises, and so I was um, I was told, yeah, well, uh, I took on faith that uh, I would even have lab space. They told, said, yeah, we'll find you lab space when you get there. And so I had a lot of surprises. Uh, Oregon State, uh, over the time I've been here, has been making a big transition from being a nominally R one school with uh, mostly teaching focused state school to being heavily research focused. And so just a lot of the um, 
things that one expects to, uh, bureaucratic mechanisms one expects to have in place have been evolving or appearing while I've been here. In some cases, that's been great because we can, we can make up the rules because there are no rules since we get to make them up. In other cases, I run into things where it's like, why, 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 why can't you do this? Why, why don't you know how to uh, set up uh, these basic uh, administrative operations? And so but working back and forth on that, um, it's been, uh, it's been challenging at times, but also it's been greatly rewarding. Like when we uh, for our building, um, we actually um, we uh, we were able to put forward a pitch that we got to take over a big old shell of a high bay building that no one else wanted, and got to go in there, got a renovation budget for it, and decked it out and set it up nicely. So there's been a lot of things that I wouldn't have otherwise run into at most other places that I've gotten to go through and do, but and that's balanced out the. Uh, just running into uh, there should be a process for this and there isn't aspects of things. Yep, that's interesting though. So I mean, what to be th going through such transition with a school, um, yeah. you could, you, I think that would make a really interesting article on some levels. Yeah. So Santa, what did you find that was the most surprising first year? Um, I think for me, it was maybe maybe particular to my situation but it was sort of like the lack of guidance on what you're even supposed to do so i made a lot of mistakes in my first year and i think part of that is on me because of course you know you can have good mentors but you know it's on the mentee to reach out to them when you actually need advice and i think i was too shy a lot in the first year i didn't want to bother people i wanted to maintain good relations you know and i didn't exactly know who i was supposed to ask about certain things so you know it's it's your start. Everyone has their own thing to do. Everyone's busy, right? So you have to make sure that you're you know, getting advice when you can get it. So I can give some specific examples of things I did wrong. Um, you know, one thing is, you know, we're, we're strongly encouraged as junior faculty to apply for these career awards that the different funding agencies offer, which is fine, which is great. One thing that no one told me, though, is that there's actually a penalty for certain of the agencies for applying too early. Um, because you have a limited number of times you can apply. So the NSF and the DOE career awards, you can only apply three times each. And, you know, they tell you, you it's supposed to be for junior faculty, so you don't need initial results, but that's a lie. You need initial results. And so I made the mistake of essentially wasting one of my, let's say, NSF career attempts by applying for it too early when I really didn't have any results that weren't from my postdoc, which kind of don't count. Um, and, you know, and, uh, so I, I wasted an attempt and, and honestly, some, someone should have just told me, hey, hold off, you know, wait till you get a paper published first in this area and then you'll have more success, which is eventually what happened. But, but you know, again, I think that was on me for not reaching out, not obtaining enough specific advice on things to do and, and to not do. And, and actually like Ross, I also had problems with getting my lab set up. Um, you know, they did have a space for me, but it needed to be renovated and ended up taking a whole year to get renovated. So I really couldn't start experiments until sort of a year after after I arrived, which was a which was a burden, right, and delayed that process of getting papers so I can get funding. <laughs> yep, for sure. So Nira, um, I mean, I just think it's so cool that you all have the your your labs, right? Like it's your name on the lab. I think that's really neat. Um, so can you share a little bit about the balance between your teaching responsibilities and your research responsibilities, and I don't know, maybe any other duties as assigned. But I feel like we're always in someone's job description. Sure. So I um, maybe the I'm kind of opposite of Susanna. So I'm sort of I ask for a lot of advice. I <laughs> I'm a pretty <laughs> um, I'm um, I'm married to another professor who's a couple years older than I am, um, and so uh, um, he so I've you know I've always had the benefit of kind of and you know we're actually in the same field, albeit kind of at different ends of the field, you know different spectrums of the field. Um, and, uh, so, you know, just, I have someone like at home to kind of get advice from, uh, too, um, but some really close friends who've gone into academia, um, just a couple, a couple years ahead of me. Um, so I maybe ask too many questions, but I, I do seek out a lot of advice. So I, um, uh, a lot of, you know, I sort of the, the advice I kind of always had in my head, um, and I'm always cautious of sort of saying this out loud, but you know, we're all at, we are, we're at research institutions. We're going to go up for tenure on research and research is really important. <laughs> so, um, I, I was somebody that, you know, I, I took the advice to heart of don't spend too much time on your teaching, um, because 
you really need to prioritize establishing your research program. Um, and I wanna be clear, that doesn't mean that I don't take my teaching seriously um, and that I don't love it. Actually, one thing I didn't mention about my bio is that my dream up until I decided to go to grad school was actually to be a high school math teacher. And I got teaching certification while at MIT. So I was very focused on this dream of being a high school math teacher. Um, um, so I so I like that a lot, but I, I made a very conscious choice um, to really focus on research and do a good job at teaching, but not overextend myself and try to be superwoman on, on teaching. And sometimes that meant purposely, you know, waiting until I only had a couple hours to prepare my notes so that I wouldn't spend too much time on it. Um, I hear a lot of people who say, oh, I spent all day doing this and I got explicit advice. Don't do that. <laughs> purposely <laughs> procrastinate on that, prioritize writing that grant, prioritize writing that paper, prioritize that research meeting with your students. So I was very deliberate um, about doing that. Um, and then, you know, and, and then the other piece of advice I got was, you know, I've been, I've been very fortunate to be in a department where I think that there are a lot of senior faculty who've looked out for me. So they've made sure that I'm not on too many committees that I'm, you know, they, I got feedback at one point saying you should do less service. And I didn't even think I was doing very much. Um, so I, I don't feel like I've been overextended. Um, and I was also asked, you know, what committee do you want to be on? So I chose to be on the graduate admissions committee because I get first pick and not first pick, I, but I get a first look at who is applying. Um, so I made decisions so that the service I was doing was also directly benefiting um, something that was very important, especially in mean, hiring grad students is always important, but especially when you're a junior faculty, that first crop of students that you hire is super important. So from that perspective, um, you know, I, I, I appre I'm, I'm grateful that I got a lot of good advice and I, and I followed it. <laughs> I think that um, it, has, it has paid off. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. So I, we have questions coming in, which makes me very happy. Um, but I just wanna go around to each of you and just ask if you would just give us just a little like one thing that you would go back in time while we're in my time machine here, um, go back in time and tell yourself to either focus more on or worry about less that first or second year um, in your role. Who wants to go first? I can go okay. first. Oh. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, so um, I think one thing that I would go back and do more of, especially before I hire, I, I started in January and didn't hire students till August. So I had a, a kind of grace period in the beginning um, where I didn't have any students. Um, and I would have read more, um, just read more papers. So um, congrats, Susanna and Ross, and both having career. I've, I've tried twice. The summer's my last chance, and I really, really want it. Um, and that's one thing that I um, am, uh, uh, that I've been really working towards. And I, and I, wish that when I had, before things got really busy, that I'd done more to um, uh, read, read more papers, get, um, get a, um, a better sense of, of the field. I, I find that as you get farther along, you get busier and busier, and it gets harder and harder to make the time to dig deep um, into some of the things that you really need to, to establish an important foundation. So going back, that's something that I could have done better early on in my, mm -hmm. in my career. Great. Okay, Ross. Uh, I think I'm uh, going to do, put two things in there. The first is, uh, which I'd be a little bit more careful uh, with who are the initial students I pulled in. It's very easy, it's very tempting to, uh, I remember my thinking at the time was uh, getting, uh, realizing that I couldn't myself do all of the, do all the things that need to be done. And so I needed, uh, needed more bodies, which is definitely key. You need a group. You, you can't just, uh, it's dangerous like the, um, you can't have a general going off in, uh, in the front line of the battle. General has to be back thinking about what's happening. You need to, you need to get that group there, but be careful about pulling in the people. When I when we started the program, uh, it was a couple of years lag before we got the very strong students that we're now getting. And so I um, took on some students who now I wouldn't take on. I would have uh, waited a little bit and been, been more focused on that. So be, be, uh, because the first couple of students, I think I had a couple of years stumble in the beginning of my setting up my program, just because I had students who were competent, but they just weren't weren't able to do the kind of work that I needed to be done in order to get my research program going. And then uh, the other piece, um, the, the other piece that, uh, there is that uh, there's a fine balance to tune, take between um, working with your core competency and then broadening out your program and differentiating it from the uh, from your advisor's program. I think I saw something bubbling in from the uh, chat. I saw half the message come through there. So 
um, there's a fine line there. And so, uh, and I think I tried to do too many branches of uh, things and I got funding for uh, starting off in too many different branches. And it would have been better if I had uh, found some way of pivoting what I got funding on and narrowing the focus on uh, one, like one core thing and then one side branch. I ended up with like two or three side branches and uh, a couple of those absorbed a bunch of energy, maybe got a small paper or two out, but didn't, didn't really go far. And so may, maybe maybe it's the case that, uh, that you have to have those because one of them is going to go through the other ones. You don't know which one's going to work. But uh, if I'd focused a little bit earlier on which on the ones that, that seem to be hitting takeoff point, then I think things would have um, been a little bit smoother at the beginning. Thanks for sharing that. Susanna, what about you? Sure. Okay. The one thing I would have done um, much more of my first couple of years, if I could go back in time, um, is related to this idea of not asking for help, but it's, I would have pursued um, more collaborative work with uh, my more senior colleagues, both just in my department or around campus, um, because I think a skill that I lacked was, again, how, how to write a grant proposal, which is like a skill in and of itself, right? It's not about being a good writer. It's about knowing <laughs> how you're supposed to frame things. And so I think I would have pursued those collaborations more actively so that I could get that experience, you know, from a senior person who knew how to do that. Like the collaborations I did pursue were with more junior people, which I, I honestly always still to this day find more fun, <laughs> but um, they may, you know, but really I needed, I needed a mentor and I needed someone to teach me how to write a good grant proposal. And that should have been a senior person. So that's what I would do. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's hard. We all probably still have the imposter syndrome, right? No matter what level of success that you achieve. Um, and I wish that we could go back in my time machine so you could do all of these things. So thanks for sharing that. And of course, it's easy to say it now, right? Um, but um, that's the beauty of learning. I'm going to kick it back over to Janiel for her to start asking some of these great audience questions. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was really wonderful. It's been great hearing from you guys so far. And we have lots of great questions, both from our audience now and some questions that they also pre-submitted prior to the event. And so I'd like to get going with some of these. Um, so one of the questions from Margaret Coad or Code, sorry, Margaret. Uh, when starting out, how do you decide which projects to have your students work on and which grant proposals to write? And how do you manage your research program now? I, I can start. Um, yeah, that's a great question because it's that's a really important decision. And I think Ross touched on this by saying, you know, one issue you have in thinking about forming a research program is that you don't want to do exactly what you know your previous advisors did because you both don't want to compete with them, but you also want to differentiate yourself from them. Specifically, you don't want to work with them, and that's that's related to another question I saw in the chat, which is I've seen people not get tenure. Um, at, at Hopkins because they, um, they worked too much with their graduate advisor. And so, you know, the, the evaluators looked at their record and said, well, I, I can't tell if this person was doing the work or if their advisor was really doing the work and they're still the, you know, the student effectively, right? So that's something really important. So you, you do wanna branch at least a little bit from what your advisor's doing. And you wanna make sure that you're not writing all of your papers with your old advisors. The way I decided what to work on was basically I, I didn't have a lab for my first year, so we had to do some computational theoretical work. So I, I, I luckily had a project lined up, um, you know, that we could start working on. Uh, but honestly, in your first couple of years, I would say work on whatever you can get papers out the fastest out of. That's my personal experience. Like whatever you think is going to bear, you know, short term publishable results, because that's what will help you get the funding and that's what will help you get the, the you know, the um, exposure in your field. Uh, you know, you can you can set lay the groundwork for like longer term, more exciting projects as well. I think you can usually do both of those at once, but make sure you're publishing in the first couple of years. That's, that's what I would say. Now, the way I do my research, it, it's partially funding driven, it's partially opportunity driven, but it's a, it's a lot more complicated. So I, don't, I won't talk too much about that. I'll let someone else answer. I want to just add something um, because I, I I did something very similar to what Ross described. I mean, I think and I and and I'm not sure. No, going back, I'm not sure that I would do it differently. And and so what I mean is, I had a couple different branches too, and and some of that was driven by if the funding's coming through and it looks and then you know you it's it's hard to say no to funding initially because exactly like Ross said, you don't exactly know what's going to pan out. And I'll be honest, I said yes to something that I was not really sure about, and it was great. I'm like. <laughs> Oh, 
you know, I ended up being the foundation for one student's PhD thesis, and it's not something that I'm continuing to carry on, but it actually, I learned a ton doing it. Um, it got, um, it resulted in a patent that's main thrusts, if you will, but that are still valuable and still lead to publications, which just as um, uh, Susanna said, is important um, to, you know, to get, um, to start being able to, you know, be at conferences and say, yeah, I've got, yeah, my students presenting this work and, and, and so forth. And so I think if you're lucky enough that that moons align and you can be more focused, that's awesome. But, you know, I think that there are a lot of us with, with my story and Ross's where, you know, the funding, you know, you tried out a couple of things. And what I can say is that now six years later, um, some of those threads that were really interesting, but you know, aren't gonna necessarily be major thrusts, I've winded down. And I now have eight students and four are all clearly in one thrust and the other four are very clearly in the other. And I've been able to, to converge things and I'm able to have them meet in small groups and actually share advice with one another. And this was kind of my, my vision. And so it took me time to get there, but, but I was able to bring it. And along the way, I've been able to again, learned some things out of some of those, you know, side projects and built some relationships that I think are still going to pan out in some interesting ways. Um, so, so that's just maybe part of the um, uh, struggle that you have to sort of go to early on. Thanks for that. That was really helpful. Um, Anna Fung had a great question. Anna, are you available to come on camera and ask your question? No pressure. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I can ask. Um, Oh, you want on camera? Um, yeah, one second. Whatever you're comfortable with. Um, let me scroll back up to find my question. Um, let's see. I asked about um, how you might have leveraged your undergrad connections, um, especially for those of you who didn't do a great job building relationships, uh, especially with professors in the field you did choose. So just for some background, um, I did my undergrad uh, mostly in like research and linguistics and stuff. And I really did not end up using that in my final, in my final, final career path. So for those of you who are like wishing you'd better spent your time at MIT, uh, maybe need some connections that way, what would you recommend? Just to ask a clarifying question, are you, um, are you a graduate student now or, or? Oh, um, I'm a first year assistant professor now. So I'm, um, um, I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the tenure track, but um, you know, with COVID going on, oh, it's hard to this, network. It's hard to figure things out. End. So, any advice would be great. Nira, you're cutting in and out. Just an FYI. <laughs> I don't know, Ross. Do you want to yeah. take that? Sure. Uh, yeah. So um, I was going to ask another clarifying question. So you're talking about uh, leveraging undergrad connections. So you're talking about uh, peers uh, that you, friends you had in undergrad who are now also in academic positions or or professors you, you professors at MIT who you interacted with uh, when you were an undergrad and now going back to them as a faculty member. More of the professors, like people that you would have been tangentially related to, but not yeah. like, not like your friends, right? Not like the people who you'd email without question, but more the people who you might have been kind of ad in adjacent social circles or people who were like your professors or, you know, TA stuff like that. Let's see, I'm thinking about that. So uh, during my PhD work, uh, I, I went back and actually worked in a lab from the professor who had been in a different area of mechanical engineering whose class I'd really liked, but um, uh, then my research path had been arced in and turned out to have applications in that field. So I was able to go back and say, hey, uh, could I some work with you and then uh uh she's been in ongoing contact uh with my work so that's been good there uh and then a couple of other professors i've uh gone back to uh various points and talked with i haven't done any direct career networking uh with them mostly um but just more going back and just getting a sense for uh how am i uh, how, how am i doing does this look like a reasonable path to be on things like that thank you yeah, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you because I don't think I've done that at all, really. And there are people, I'm, I'm like you in the sense that there are people in my field at MIT who would be useful for me to know that I just don't know because I didn't interact with them as an undergrad, you know, because I was doing something else. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anyone has a good answer. Let me know. <laughs> I have, I guess, one example. Um, there was somebody that I interviewed with to potentially do research 
when I was still an undergraduate and I was maybe going to join her group in ME um, or in course two. Um, and I ended up not, but then, you know, would run into her at conferences ever since I was, you know, when I was in grad school. So we've always kind of stayed familiar. Um, and then um, I actually recently, you know, well, this year, since I'm going up for tenure this fall, I've been um, doing some Zoom seminars and, and giving, you know, promoting my work a little bit. Um, so I reached out to her and, and asked her to help set up a, a seminar for me at MIT, and she did, and, and that was um, a lot of fun. And I just did that about a week ago, actually. Um, so that's um, one way, you know, and, and so that's one way, I guess, in which I've leveraged that network. Awesome, thank you so much, Anna. That was really that was a wonderful question. Uh, we had an interesting question from uh, JW. Uh, JW, are you available? I can also ask it if you want. Um, oh yeah, um, I can. I can. Um, kind of, it's a bit of a long question. I can try to summarize it. Basically, for those of us who are interested in, say, uh, professorships or, or lecture positions that are more focused on teaching, um, I'm just curious. What are some of your observations or experiences um, in that kind of arena? Even though I know all of our panelists um, have been talking about being more more research focused. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that a little bit because um, I, I seriously thought about applying to teaching faculty positions as well because I, I always like teaching a lot. Um, you know, first of all, if you're in electrical and computer engineering, um, let me know because <laughs> I might have a job for you. Um, but also, uh, <laughs> I think, I think, um, you know, there's two types of teaching faculty positions you can get. There's there's faculty positions like maybe one of Nero's students has, right, where you're at an undergraduate focused institution. Okay. And I know several people in those roles. I think actually all the people I know in those roles really love them. <laughs> I think that that's a great track to go on. Then you, there are, of course, teaching tracks at research focused universities. So, you know, I'm mostly familiar with my university, Johns Hopkins. So we have uh, teaching tracks. So, you know, you can be appointed as like either a lecturer or a um, uh, teaching professor, but that's it's sort of in the weeds, the differences there. But um, what I would say is those roles are difficult. I think on the one hand, you get to interact with a lot of students in those roles and the students love you. And th those people in those roles are definitely the best teachers we have. But, you know, again, I'm trying to be honest here. I think that there's, they have a lack of both job security and respect at our university, which is unfortunate. I don't think it should be that way. And there's those of us who are trying to push to, to better the culture, but I think it can be hard because I do think that despite, you know, the fact that we don't want it to be this way, sometimes teaching faculty are viewed sort of as second class citizens among the faculty at, at research universities and that they don't end up having a lot of say in matters of faculty governance, for example, um, which again is unfortunate, but, it, but it's something to, I think, go into with eyes wide open is what I would say. Right, and is that a is that one of the distinctions between a lecture versus being on on being, uh, versus a teaching professorship, or? Yeah, at my university, yes, at my university, there is sort of like it's it's not technically a tenure track for teaching professors, but it functions like a tenure track for teaching professors. So there is more job security if you're if you're hired as a teaching professor as opposed to a lecturer. Yes, although so, yes. some people can switch between them in some cases. So you oh. like we've promoted people from lecturer to teaching professor before, so that's possible in a way that's less common, I think, for research tracks. And would you have a sense of what kind of qualifications they're looking for in the interview process? Well, they're definitely looking for teaching experience, right? They, you know, we rarely hire people straight out of graduate school unless they've really like maybe perhaps they've done a teaching certificate during graduate school and like actually been responsible for a class, not just as a TA. Um, so we want teaching experience. You know, some research experience is fine, but like when we hire for those roles, we're looking for teaching experience and, you know, any kind of like course development is helpful, but, but that's going to be the main qualification. And some people we've hired for those roles have also come from industry, but they've usually then had teaching experience either before their industry roles or after their industry roles before we hire them you know, at a research university in a teaching professor job. Would you say those positions are pretty competitive? Kind of at the same level as as a research um, track or no look there we get a lot of people applying for them but most of the people who apply don't have the right qualifications so you know the, again this is my personal experience yeah, yeah, it totally. may be different mm -hmm. for others but what we see is that very few of the people 
who apply to those roles actually have the right experience. People either have no teaching experience whatsoever, or maybe they've been a TA, which just it frankly isn't enough to get a job like that. Or they, they have tons of research experience and they're clearly trying to get a backdoor research position by applying for a teaching position because that's what's available, right? And then they come and they give a talk that's all about their research, but we're looking to hire a teacher. You know, you may have a chance to do research in a position like that, but it's not gonna be your main focus. So, yeah. So, so if you have the right qualifications, they are actually in very high demand, especially in technical fields where, you know, probably people like that can get higher paying jobs elsewhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna add one thing for two reasons. Um, another thing I didn't mention back to my, my <laughs> high level of indecision, um, I actually thought I wanted to end up at an undergraduate focused institution. So when I was applying for jobs, I applied to both. I had interviews at both um, and I think even my advisor thought that I was probably going to find a better fit um, being there. And I um, uh, had my, and I actually expected to to not enjoy my Purdue interview. And I still was like, I'm not really sure I want to do this whole R1, the you know, the whole the whole shebang. Um, had my, you know, had the interview at Purdue and was like, this is amazing. I love this. I could picture myself there. Like it felt like everything was coming together. And then a few weeks later, had the interview at the other institution, the um, under, the teaching focused one. And I, I don't want to say which one it was, but um, but really, but ended up um, just found that I, I wasn't going to fit in. I, it was, I was kind of surprised. Um, uh, but um, so I guess I, so I, I bring that up just to say, I don't know if you're someone who's actually kind of teetering on, you know, you want to do an academic position, but you're not sure which one you might be um, uh, happier with. And if you want to talk more about that on offline, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, Cause there aren't too many people, I think in my group, <laughs> in my category, that sort of really were keeping even both of those doors open. Um, but I was, um, but what I'll say is, um, again, I have a student who, you know, came, who went to Rose Hallman as an undergrad. So he came out of a system, out of a, you know, undergraduate focused institution and told me like from day one, that was his dream was to do, to do that, knew very clearly that that's what he wanted to do. Um, and, um, and I do think that, you know, if, if you are really passionate about teaching, I would strongly encourage you to, to consider that because those are, you know, because you you enjoy the benefits of a tenure track position and the job security and the autonomy um, and the um, and there's and, and and there's a lot of different ways in which you can still um, uh, kind of you know it's different institutions run it different ways but there's a lot of really great schools whether it's Rose Hallman or Kettering or Bucknell Harvey Mudd I mean there's just there's a there's a lot of choices and so um, Olin um, so um, and what my what my student. Um, did and, and that I encourage him to do and he did do um, we have a program within at Purdue where graduate students who are doing really well both in their research and, and also want to pursue a teaching career um, can apply for a fellowship that we that is competitive internally but if they get it they um, they are given uh, the, they are given um, the ability to teach an entire class for a semester so um, he then you know had that experience had that on his resume um, and um, and that I'm sure was really important for him uh, landing this landing this job. But I think those those positions are competitive. Um, absolutely, I think the tenure track ones at undergraduate institutions. Um, and then I would kind of echo uh, a, a lot of the comments that Susanna made about you know lectures. I actually interviewed also for a lecturer position before I decided to go on the faculty job market. Um, and um, and that was one thing that I was sort of worried about is if I would find it frustrating to to be um, Know, lower on the totem pole, uh, so to speak, um, a little bit. Um, what I will say is that we have a handful of lecturers um, in our department, and I know that our, our department's been really aggressive about actually doing a lot more to promote staff, um, and they are given a lot of responsibility to help impact curriculum. So I think that that's been a deliberate culture shift um, in my department. So I think that the lecturers are actually pretty happy, but it is true that they, they are, don't have the same rank, status, security, um, that a faculty member does. So I think it really comes down to what you really want out of the job, what level of responsibility you do or don't don't want. Um, and um, yeah, and that might help you to kind of narrow down what you what you want to pursue. Thank you so much, Nira. That was a really great response. Thank you, Susanna. Thanks for your questions, JW. Thank you very much. It's yeah, all of, you. of course. Um, and I wanted to ask you, uh, Professor Hatton, um, we yeah. had a question about um, as you guys remember, it was not that long ago, you know, with the shutdown STEM, Black and the Ivory movements, et cetera. Uh, we've seen that, uh, you know, institutional racism and other forms of, you know, like 
inequity and inequality are present institutions, regardless of things like endowment or status or whatever it is. And so what I wanted to ask you is, um, what gives you hope for future generations, given what happened in the past year, what's been happening for decades? And if you want to share your, also your personal experience with how uh, the last year was handled, you know, in your department, in your lab, et cetera. So I think there are a couple of questions in there, so I'll pull them out. Uh, one of them is the, uh, with the, um, the diversity side of things. So I think I've been seeing a lot of, uh, uh, at least in my university, there's been a lot of effort to very proactively address um, address those concerns. There's been a strong push, uh, uh, and I think I've seen this across multiple universities at this point for, uh, for instance, faculty hiring now has a uh, diversity uh, statement as along with your um, al along with your teaching and research statements, there's now diversity statements, and we're even seeing that now down at the uh, undergrad at, at the uh, grad, grad applicant level. So our uh, so we have um, at least within our robotics program now we have a diversity um, uh, diversity awareness uh, portion to understand uh, to the applicant pool, and so that's bringing some of that out to making it uh, um, uh, making it uh, part of. Uh, what goes into the whole program, and I think some places it uh, has been gets you have to be carefully can be pushed too far in front. But uh, for, but if it's done right, and I think I've been seeing places where, including where I am, where it is being done right, I think that's valuable for uh, guiding the program. And then uh, over the and then um, over the past year in general, uh, I think with the um, uh, with the COVID response things, I think there's been a lot more. Uh, focus on uh, flexibility. I've seen for for, for people working with things, and so I have. Um, uh, so um, I was already, but and my university was already fairly flexible. I was already actually I was on uh, parental leave uh, when when all this happened uh, and all the shutdown happened. So um, I um, uh, and so the and then the move to making being accommodating with for flexibility things I think has helped a lot with. That I know uh, for, uh, some people have other experiences where it's just too much gets thrown on them at home, but for the experience I've had is that uh, the university has been good about getting that making that flexibility and making it work. Thanks for your answer. That was great. And if anyone else had any like thoughts about that, like things you've seen your universities doing, um, and this comes from like, you know, just through my personal experience, I just finished my PhD last month. Um, a lot of my peers who are people, thank you, <laughs> who are people of color as well in graduate school, uh, all have the, you know, the idea or the, the thought that like maybe academia is not built for us. So if you guys, as junior faculty, as a future generation of like the tenured faculty who are, you know, like, what what gives you like hope that like it it will be okay for everyone? Does that make sense? I think just what I would add, you know, I, um, I you know, I, I'm not gonna, well, I'll say two things, you know, one, um, I, you know, not being African American, I'm not gonna pretend like I understand, you know, that I've fully experienced the same thing that a lot of um, um, African American and, and, and black faculty um, do. My closest collaborator at Purdue, um, is black, and I think she's one of two black faculty um, in the entire College of Engineering um, at Purdue, which has several hundred or multiple hundred um, faculty. So um, I, you know, I am aware of her experience, and um, and actually, she's just been helping, and we've been capping off a whole week of Black Trailblazers in Engineering um, at Purdue. So it's been a really successful program. I think that the events of last year, um, you know, aren't gonna. You know, things aren't going to change overnight, but definitely there is a much more heightened awareness. Um, you know, I think, I mean, there really should have been an awareness for a long time, right? But um, I think that, you know, I, I don't think we're moving backwards, I guess is what I would say. Um, I think that we absolutely are moving forward. I think it's becoming increasingly less acceptable um, uh, for people to, um, uh, to, uh, Kind of sustain discriminatory discriminatory practices, um, and there are a lot of people in positions of power um, and in, in important administrative positions who are actively pushing um, to change culture, to change hiring habits, etc. And that's what makes a difference. And I've seen I've seen a shift from just even my own colleagues and the way that I hear them talk about these issues, the level of awareness that they have, um, and this is especially senior faculty who. Um, you know, 
senior white male faculty who are the sort of the perennial group who maybe are um, less sensitive to to some of these issues. I've seen some of them be the strongest advocates for for change um, in in my own department and, and across the college at Purdue. So um, so I so I see a lot of positive things happening, and I think that if I were and I and I think that my black colleagues see that happening as well. Great, thank you so much, Nira. That was really helpful and really reassuring to hear from you guys. Um, a question that we had from a lot of people, a few people before the event started, uh, were centered around um, this thing, academics versus industry, academia versus industry. And a concern that two or three of them had was that they were in academia, they had left, gone to industry for a few years, and now they're worried it's too late to come back or can they ever go back? Uh, what do you say to those? People. I, mean, I imagine it varies depending on the field, but uh, what would you say to those attendees? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can say that, you know, what I would say is that there's concrete examples, right, where people have gone to industry and then come back to academia. I think we, could, we probably all know some of those examples. Um, so it happens all the time. So no, it's not too late. Um, you know, that being said, of course, there might be several steps that you're going to have to take if you really want to get back into academia, right? So one thing is that you tend to have like a publication gap when you're in industry because most industries don't really let you publish. Um, but, you know, if you have anything like patents, right, intellectual property or something like that, that, that can sort of bolster an, an application. I mean, you might have to do, you know, things like start, um, you know, making sure your employer allows you to give talks, right, at, at conferences and things like that if you want to get back into the game. Um, depending on where you are in your industrial career, um, you can get back into academia by doing a postdoc, right? But obviously, if you're very many years into it, that may not be so appealing. Um, so many universities also do things like they'll, they'll hire um, industry as, you know, both adjunct professors, but also occasionally it can be easier to get back in as a research professor um, if you can sort of self-fund through industrial connections, for example. Um, and that can be a way back into academia and ultimately to the tenure track if it interests you. Uh, potentially. So yeah, there, there's ways to get back in. And again, if, for example, you started your own company or if you, you, you have a lot of IP that's, you know, in an, in an area of interest, let's say to academia, but, you know, certainly it's possible to, to make that jump. And again, we all know examples, so. Yeah, to, to add to that, the only, you know, I've, all, I've seen enough and, and heard enough examples of different people with different career paths that I feel like there's nothing that's not possible. To, you know, there's there's maybe things that are less common, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, and it really is all about, you know, how you sell yourself in your CV. And that's not just true of trying to get into academia. That's that's any job. So if, if you're in that situation and, and um, you know, find some, again, trusted mentors, try to find an example of someone who's already done that. Um, and, and start asking a lot of questions and, and get advice. If you're in an industry or in an R&D lab where you have been able to publish, you're probably, maybe you're okay. You know, it's the, the very, the hardest situation would be the one in which you truly have not been publishing or attending any academic conferences or maintained any connection to academia at all. But in a lot of cases, I know folks who at some of the um, R&D labs um, in my field at least are able to keep coming to conferences and, and so forth, so. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, uh, Ross, you recently, you just brought up a few minutes ago about uh, being on maternity leave last year. Yeah. And uh, Nira, I think it was, you mentioned a two-body two problem. I forget who exactly. Um, but a lot of people in the audience, we have a lot of women in the audience and a lot of people who want family probably in the audience. Um, what advice would you give them uh, regarding balancing your personal life and your partner and your family with also publishing and making the right connections and going to the right conferences and all those different things. I don't know who wants to start, whoever. Ross, you can go first if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's a tricky balance. And it's one of the things that uh, was on my mind uh, with uh, coming to Oregon State because I knew that um, uh, there would be a couple of things that would make it easier to balance. Oregon State had started and has been continuing on uh, improving uh, better, uh, some good programs for, um, uh, for, for that uh, work-life balance, and then being in the uh, being in the smaller town where I'm uh, very close uh, very close to campus has meant that it's been a little bit easier for me to do the schedule balancing that's been needed in order to uh, 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 spend some of the time with my family. So I have a, a one-year-old and a five-year-old, and so uh, being able to 
uh, do that scheduling time. But yeah, you, it is it is important to be able to uh, carve out that time. And so finding some way, depending on how, how you how you tend to work, uh, I've uh, some people I know will do uh, like a very sharp cutoff. Okay, this is my work time. This is family time. Uh, I tended to do more of a blended piece where I'll um, make myself more available for short amounts of time over the day. The um, with the pandemic and everyone being home, that's uh, that, that's that's very much become part of that. But even before then, I'd been um, I'd worked out a schedule for myself where I could spend more time around the family and interleave uh, my responsibilities in order to uh, have that working. But I think the key thing is figuring out what uh, figuring out some way that works for you to make uh, make something like that work, and then figure out how to make the other externalities around you reinforce that and support that, rather than uh, being too much in the way. Yeah, well, um, so I have a um, one-year-old and a four-year-old, so I think I was also on maternity leave when COVID hit. My daughter was born in February, just about a couple of weeks before the shutdown. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and I did have a two-body problem, so we were, we were fortunate for my husband and I to both get jobs together um, at Purdue. Um, but um, I think that what I would, I agree a lot with what Ross said in terms of, you know, figuring out what works, what works for you. I got, um, you know, advice, not just when it comes to sort of managing a family and, and being pre-tenure, but also just um, just in general, you know, just this, this whole job and, and, and being academic of not being afraid to change things up if, if what you're doing isn't working um, and um, maybe not be afraid to um, like throw money at things if you can to make your life easier. So for example, you know, like two months ago or so, we were really having trouble managing now with this, with the second kiddo, like getting dinner on the table and, and now we're at home all the time and getting lunch and so forth. So, so we subscribed to daily harvest, which we were never going to do before, but um, it was one of those things where, you know, um, sometimes there are things that we have done to help make our life easier and, and um, that we would love to do ourselves or we wish we could do, but rather than trying to do things that we can't, we found that we're happier for like, no, right now we can't, <laughs> we can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're gonna, we're gonna outsource this and this and this and, so, and, and focus on the things that are most, most important. Um, and for any of the, um, uh, you know, women on the call that are thinking about whether they might wanna, if they could have kids pre-tenure or not, if that's a, something that's going through your mind. Um, I, I made the decision that I, I knew I wanted a family and I um, didn't want to wait till um, potentially after tenure to, to start a family. Um, and I have um, a couple of um, friends who are a little bit more, a couple years ahead of me who had done it. And so I, you know, I felt like I had this anchor of knowing like I can do it, it can work. Um, I'm you know, fortunate to have a supportive spouse um, which makes um, a big difference, um, but it is hard. Um, I did get advice from one colleague um, who had told me to try to wait till I was two years into the job to have the first um, kid, just so that like this, you know, things were kind of starting to move. <laughs> um, and I had my, my son, you know, almost exactly two years into the job. <laughs> so, um, so overall, I'd say it, it, you know, it's, it's been challenging for sure. And there's things that I've had to say, opportunities that I've definitely had to say no to that I probably wouldn't have said no to if I didn't have two kids. Um, but every, you know, life's a, a balance and you make choices. Um, and I think that, um, and I think that, you know, actually in some ways the pandemic has helped to highlight to people, you know, the, the challenges that folks with families have. Um, and I, and I, and I, at least I've, um, had a really supportive, like all of my colleagues have been super supportive, um, about it. And, you know, I had a, a sponsor who wanted to have a meeting today from five to six. And I said, I'm sorry, I have a hard stop at five 30. That's when my kids come home and that's when we're getting dinner on the table. Um, so, you know, sometimes things have to cut into family time, but I try to be really strict about cutting things off when I need to. Thank you all for speaking so candidly about that. It's really nice to hear uh, really honest answers about this really complicated problem. Uh, we, I wanted to combine or two more questions we have from the crowd. They're both about the tenure track, which is ostensibly the most scary part of becoming a professor. Um, and one of them is uh, what, have, like, what, what mistakes have you seen? Uh, people cause people to not get tenure. And one mentioned seminars. I think it was Colleen uh, and Crystal. And they mentioned, uh, what can you do to like help yourself forward and tenure track, like giving seminars, et cetera. So if you guys could uh, provide maybe your top advice for what, what to do, what not to do, I guess. <laughs> so I, I think I can uh, provide on the, um, uh, cause you don't often see uh, at least 
uh, where I've seen, uh, been there, you don't often see like people making clear mistakes, but I think one clear mistake I saw was someone who didn't, uh, wasn't getting uh, research funding coming in. And so then decided to fund their summer by teaching summer classes, which because we're a state school with a lot of uh, educational things, there's a pile of summer classes that, that are able to be taught. And so he started teaching the summer classes and that started a spiral where he wasn't spending the time doing the proposals and then, um, uh, and 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 then of course he didn't get the proposals, so he then spent more time on the uh, uh, spent more time on the summer teaching, and then that just spiraled out. And so I think it, uh, there were a couple of other things that happened, but I think that was a clear thing not to do uh, there. And then giving giving seminars, I think yeah, leveraging whatever connections you have, start getting invitations for seminars, uh, working at conferences, uh, being candid if uh, you've got uh, friends who are in slightly, um, slightly more senior positions where they are putting together the, um, pulling together seminars. I, I'm running, I run the seminar for robotics at Oregon State and I'm certainly often, quite often looking for people to fill the slots. And so just let, letting people know, hey, I'd, I'd, I'd love to come, come, have, come uh, make a visit and uh, then they'll invite you out for seminar. You get to go uh, see the other campus, get to meet, uh, meet lots of people while you're out there because you meet, um, because you get your full slate, full slate day of uh, meetings, and things can build up out of there. So I think definitely uh, leveraging that chain. I can give a, you know, this is sort of gossip, but I can give a few concrete examples of people I know at my university who did not get tenure, and what we speculate are the reasons for that, essentially, right? So these are people who like got to the point where they actually went up for tenure and didn't get it. So, you know, some people sort of get counseled out right before that happens, which if you're not, you know, hitting reasonable milestones, et cetera. But, but so this is about like, you know, if you do most of the right things, right, the, that last step. So one, one example I already mentioned, which is basically we think this person published too much with their graduate advisor and so therefore didn't differentiate their own work enough. So, you know, one concrete thing you can do is to stop publishing with your <laughs> graduate advisors, you know, I mean, there's always going to be loose ends you want to tie up and you want to get those papers out, right? But at some point you have to, you have to cut that off <laughs> to, to show that you're an independent, you know, person. Uh, another thing is um, some per someone didn't get tenure because they were never uh, a PI on a grant, basically. So they were always a co, they were co-PIs, they had many collaborations, but you kind of have to, you know, at, at some of these schools, at least you, you got to have your own grant or at least be the PI. Mm -hmm. Another person, oh, there's so many examples. Um, um, another person actually got dinged, essentially we think for being too interdisciplinary. So interdisciplinary is a, is a buzzword, right? That everybody loves. It's great to be interdisciplinary. We all think we're interdisciplinary. Frankly, everybody says they, they're interdisciplinary these days. However, you have to have you know, one field or one area that you're kind of known in is the, is the problem with being too interdisciplinary. So this person, they really did publish in a whole bunch of different fields, but the issue ended up being that they weren't really known for one thing. So they weren't like a quote unquote leader in any one field just because their interests were so varied and so inter too interdisciplinary. And then the final example I give, which is maybe the, the best advice I can give is there was a person in my own department who didn't get tenure because this person only like they only had essentially one PhD student who had sort of like finished or was close to finishing by the time they went up for tenure and they didn't really have any others in the pipeline and you know if I'm being honest the reason is this person was mean to students and so students would start to work for them and then they would quit because they were mean and they maybe expected too much and it was a weird field but you know so my advice is be really nice to your students <laughs> the students are your most important asset so be nice to them and if and if you find that they're they're quitting you know sit down and have a real think with yourself about what's going on here, right? Because you, know, you gotta be able to graduate students. That's critical. So th th those are my horror stories. <laughs> yeah, as, as the only one who's not tenured and <laughs> about to go up for tenure. <laughs> um, what I'll say in terms of, of, you know, or what I've, there there's of the couple people that I heard about that didn't get tenure and, and sort of the speculation about why in both cases, essentially what one of my mentors told me was that in both cases that individual, those individuals were given clear advice, you know, around the two, three year mark kind of sort of thing that, you know, you're not doing enough of this, you need to do this. And the people deliberately didn't take the advice. And so um, there was a feeling that, you know, it's, I think it's one thing if, you know, you're, 
you know, trying to hit a great, you know, maybe you're struggling to hit grants and, um, you know, and, and that happens for some people. Sometimes it takes a couple extra years for like things to really fall into place. Um, and, uh, you know, and usually the advice that you're going to get, especially if like everyone's giving you the same advice, it's probably good advice to take. Um, and I think again, in these situations, these people were getting clear, consistent messages of try this, you need to do this, this doing this is not working. Um, and they kind of stuck to their guns as opposed to saying, okay, let me actually take this very clear advice that, that I'm being given. Um, and so, you know, that the, I think the thing that's been told to me that to sort of reassure me is that I think in most cases, even the ones that Susanna just highlighted are that, you know, um, you know, I mean, the publishing with advisor, that's a big no, no. So I'm not sure <laughs> Joel was doing that one. I feel like in a lot of these cases, like those people should have known or should have gotten that feedback, you know, earlier on to the, you know, sometimes, there, so sometimes there are surprises, but a lot of what folks have told me is that like, you should, you should know, you know, whether you're in pretty good shape or you're not in good shape. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're not, then it could be either because you're totally oblivious or maybe you, you've gotten really bad mentorship and your department hasn't done their job to give you feedback and maybe that's the fault, you know, but you, there, you know, you, there things, there shouldn't really be a lot of surprises necessarily by this point. Um, and uh, about the seminar, so like I, I mentioned um, earlier that um, I'm sort of, you know, some people talk about a tenure tour where, you know, you try to line up again, a bunch of seminars as you're going, you know, in your last one or two years before you're going to go up so that colleagues in the field start to get to, you make sure that uh, influential and important colleagues in the field know your research because those people might get tapped to write letters for your um, package. Um, so, and then I was actually concerned about being able to do it because I just had another baby um, and then COVID hit and now they're all in Zoom. <laughs> so, uh, so I've been doing a lot of Zoom seminars <laughs> um, and I was given advice to, um, like Ross said, um, you know, just email people directly, right? There's no, um, so, it, it's not that people, um, I mean, it'd be great if people were emailing me left and right. We'd love to give you, you know, we'd love for you to give a talk, but um, I'm going to be very frank. I have, I have a spreadsheet of exactly who I was going to ask and why and why they were a strategic person. And I have emailed every single one and invited myself to about 15 universities. Um, and um, so I've been, again, very <laughs> deliberate about making sure that I'm, you know, doing everything I need to do to position myself well to get tenure. So again, it's not, it's, there, there are not secrets about what you got to do. And, and I think that's the key thing. Make sure that, you know, if you're already in a trainer track position, talk to people who, you know, just a couple of years ahead of you. And, and oftentimes some of the best mentors aren't the like super senior faculty, or they can be mentors and other things, but talk to people just four years ahead of you, three years ahead of you, um, who could either tell you about mistakes that they've made, um, or can say, no, here's exactly what I did in year four. Here's what I did in year five. Um, don't, you know, I had a colleague who said, don't, don't wait until the semester before. She said, because people start putting together their seminar series schedules, you know, another semester in advance. So I was emailing people last summer to get on schedules for the fall and for the spring. Um, so, you know, again, but it's not, it's, it's not a hard thing to do. You just need to know that you need to do it and then follow through. Thank you so much for your honest answers again. Um, I think I can speak for everyone when I can say I would love to hear you all speak for hours and hours because this has been really wonderful. Um, but unfortunately, we are, we're out of time. And I'd like to thank the MIT Alumni Association for putting this on. Thank you, Ellen, for moderating the panel discussion. That was really incredible. And thank you sincerely to Professor Jane, Professor Hatton, and Professor Tone for being with us and for all their outstanding sharing of their experiences. So everyone else, please mark your calendars for April's Brass Rat Chat on April 8th. Our featured alumni guests will be talking about careers in and out of consulting. So thank you all again to everyone and I hope you have a wonderful evening. And thanks to everyone. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.